Welcome to Off the Record News Hour. I'm your host, Diana Longrie. Thank you for tuning in. For those of you who watch on a regular basis, you know that this program is brought to you live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake. And through a cooperative agreement, this program is also simultaneously broadcast to those studios out of the Roseville viewing area, the CTV studios. And as a result of this cooperative effort, this program reaches out to and serves 28 communities in the Northeast Metropolitan Area. Now this program, as I mentioned this evening, is live uh, on September 13th. So if you're watching it on September 13th, feel free to call in with any questions or comments that you may have for my guest or myself this evening. This program, though, is also rebroadcast at other various times depending upon which studio serves your area. So if you're watching this program on a date other than September 13th, well, don't call in because we won't be here. But uh, this evening, I think you're going to enjoy uh, my guest and our discussion. Uh, with this being a, an election year, of course, uh, we've had quite a number of different candidates on this program. And this evening, I'm very pleased to be able to have with me Ken Pentel, who is running for the governor of Minnesota. Thank you very much, Ken, for coming on the program this evening. Well, thank you, Diana. It's wonderful. It's great to be here. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. And, you know, if um, maybe uh, how we can start off is by... Uh, having uh, you introduce yourself a little bit to our viewers, let them know a little bit maybe about you know who you are and your background and and how you became interested in well in uh, politics and running for uh, the position of governor and of course uh, you are the Green Party candidate as well. That's right. That's yeah. right. Um, well, you know a wonderful um, opportunity. You know, growing up in a beautiful state. I was born in Minnesota, Minneapolis. Um, spent a lot of my time when I was younger in the middle part of the state in the great in the Brainerd Lakes area ah. uh, in the in the whitefish chain and so on so I had a chance to really you know get a, a taste of beauty fresh air clean water all that good stuff mm -hmm. right at a young age and so you know I graduated from Hopkins Eisenhower uh, high school I was we did a little college afterwards but then I said I was gonna go into show business that was my thing <laughs> I wanted to you know go out to Hollywood and you know be a star Mm -hmm. That was the and, big and thing. And people shouldn't hold that against you because we, we have uh, representatives who, when they were at a young age, ran off to the circus. So There you go. Yeah, there you see, go. So you can, you can have dreams yeah. when you're young to be part of the entertainment industry. Right. Well, uh, listen, industry. I mean, we, had, we had Jesse Ventura, who yeah. was a celebrity, <laughs> but he was a wrestler. He wasn't really an actor that much. And Arnold Schwarzenegger and, <laughs> as a governor. So, I mean, it's not uh, unusual. That's but right. the point is, is that what happened was is I never got into show business because <laughs> the first day I drove in with my mother to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. there, there were clouds in the sky. And, you know, these clouds didn't look like normal clouds. And I asked my mother, what are those clouds? And she said, that's smog. Uh -huh. And I said, what? I mean, it was covering the sky, you know, and wow. I grew up in this fresh air. And it's unbelievable, you know, just uh, shocking to me at the time. That evening, they told elderly and children they shouldn't go outside the next day because of um, air quality alerts. You oh. know, the air was too polluted to breathe. About six months later, I learned why they closed beaches, because it was so polluted, mm -hmm. no one could swim in the ocean and be on the beach. It was, you know, all sorts of greasy, oily, toxic, you know, metals plastic, syringes, tires, everything on the beach. Mm -hmm. You could see what they threw in Santa Monica Bay. Um, and then, then I learned about nuclear power plants being built on fault lines and very smart authority type people's telling me that it was okay to build nuclear power plants mm -hmm. on fault lines. So I found this to be rather unacceptable mm -hmm. uh, and uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so as, you know, at a young age, these things really had an impression on me and eventually I wandered. I was very angry about the way the earth was being treated. Mm -hmm. I found it un unacceptable that I wasn't educated on this through our television and radio outlets. Uh, this is the only planet we can live on in the universe and we're treating it terribly. Uh, and so eventually I found it un a natural outlet for it, which was Greenpeace here in Minnesota. Oh, yes. Wandered back here, started knocking on doors with Greenpeace for 11 years, uh, just really just trying to express the people the concerns about the earth. Uh, and then also I started lobbying at the state capitol on issues around solid waste, incineration, um, highway building, things like that. Uh, and uh, also speaking, um, organizing on issues, a variety of things went on. 
Uh, the, one of the big issues had to do with energy policy in mm -hmm. Minnesota and high-level nuclear waste storage down at Prairie Island. Right, uh, that was power a, plant. a very big issue. Huge. And uh, we ended up with, uh, I learned a very harsh lesson about our system, that no matter how many people you get involved, we, we reached you know, millions in Minnesota. We had d democratic support from the grassroots across all party lines to not allow nuclear waste storage, go to energy efficiency, go to renewable energy in Minnesota, stop, you know, importing massive poisons into the state. Um, and the power company uh, had way, uh, way more influence than the public that's mm -hmm. supposed to be represented by their government. Mm -hmm. And so the power company was able to spend, you know, for them, you know, they spent, you know, two, three, four, five million, it doesn't matter. Right. I mean, they can drop that because they're making a million dollars a day revenue off of Prairie Island alone. Mm -hmm. So for them, five million is a drop in the ocean over two years. It's is what just they an spent. investment in their yeah. future exactly. endeavors. Exactly. And then I learned, you know, they can go on, use our government and mm -hmm. they go on TV and radio to influence people. They go into the nonprofit community. They go to the community picnics. They cascade through the culture and they have... 35 registered lobbyists at the state capitol every year. Wow, that's you know, an amazing number. I know. And so, and, and they're investing you know, huge amounts of money. So what's happening is, is that the public has got locked out mm -hmm. of that decision, and that was a harsh reality. So from there, um, I started to, I took notice when Ralph Nader stepped up to run for president mm -hmm. in 1996 on the Green Party ticket. And the Green Party to me was the most relevant political party. I had not been involved in party politics, didn't trust it, thought it was run by big money, mm -hmm. basically, which in general it is. Right. Um, and so, but I really believed in Ralph, believed in the Green Party vision, and I've been involved ever since mm -hmm. at a grassroots level, doing a variety of activities, uh, hired, not hired, volunteering, so on. I ran for governor in 98, 2002. I'm ready to do the job. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been just an ongoing, growing experience uh, to prepare for the role I'm ready to play right now, which is governor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I guess it's an extension of my uh, kind of theater in a way. But in this case, it's very literal. It's yes. very real. It's not fabricated. It's not fiction. Uh, the reasons I'm running are based upon making sure this state is healthy and intact for ourselves, and many, many, many generations into the future. Mm -hmm. Right now, our government is influenced by people who are interested in short-term thinking, quarterly balance sheets, yearly return, two-year cycles in elections. It's a problem, and we're not able to make decisions to make sure future generations aren't being left with our problems. That's right, and you know, I, and I do feel that uh, people in Minnesota really uh, have an appreciation uh, for our environment, for our natural resources, and, and what kind of measures should we be taking uh, to protect uh, the environment. And yet, I think that you've made a very good point, is that those interests that have the money behind them, they have better resources to promote their interests than the average citizen who has a core value to say, you know what, we, as our part of our quality of life, appreciate having uh, a clean environment and what can we do uh, for sustainable practices. Right. Uh, you know, you had mm -hmm. mentioned that you uh, had spent quite a bit of time up near Brainerd in the, um, the, the Whitefish uh, lake, Change, yeah. uh -huh. uh, Lakes. And um, I grew up in northern Minnesota and as much the, the same kind of thing in that, you know, there's this appreciation for understanding about, you know, the environment and nature and yet, you know, here you are in you know, politics, what can you do, you know, to try to, uh, you know, move these uh, initiatives forward in, in such a way that people uh, see it as credible. Right. And I think much of what we're talking about has credibility with most of the public. Like you said, right. generally 80% of the public agree with what we're doing. So it's not That's Democrat, right. Republican, Independent, mm -hmm. non-affiliated. It's everybody generally agrees with what we're trying to do. And this has been going on for decades now. That's right. But the people are not being translated through their government. That's right. And that is the link that I'm working on so heartily as candidate. The credibility for most people is, is that one, they're looking for one, somebody who's prepared to do the job based upon the values they care about. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I talk about getting big money out of politics, most of the public gets it. 
because they feel excluded. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, Minnesota in, two in 2004 mm -hmm. per capita was number one in the country in the amount of money spent lobbying. Really? Well, over $42 million was spent lobbying mm. our state legislature. So what ends up happening is the citizens go vote. They pick their elected officials. Then the people go work. And they're busy working. Mm -hmm. While they're working, massive amount of wealth from around the world, the nation, the state, is orbiting around our policy makers mm -hmm. and infusing itself into our policy, the language they want, and so on. And basically, in many ways, trying to uh, um, persuade them to maybe have a different viewpoint than the actual viewpoint that they ran on when they were running for office. Right, I mean, exactly. I mean, there may be people who go into the system. What ends up happening is that these policy, these uh, moneyed interests have been around for decades and decades and decades. So they've shaped the system. They know it better than most people who go into it, mm -hmm. uh, especially their representatives. And their representatives are very charming, lobbyists we call them. Mm -hmm. But they're very influential in their ability to persuade uh, policymakers. And they'll start out where the policymaker wants to start. They'll gain the trust of the policymaker up front. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the policymaker will learn to trust people based upon what the policymaker's original intent is. But once the policymaker starts walking through the maze of policy at the state legislature, there generally is a guaranteed certain outcome. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem, is that you can send an idealist into the system, and they'll get a few crumbs in policy, but ultimately the major outcomes are still attacking our resource base, undermining Earth, setting us up for military problem solving, and it's generally a commercialized mm -hmm. effort mm -hmm. to use the government for commercial purposes. And so government can be used for that or it can be used for the people. So it's government's not bad or good in many respects. It's how it's used. So for example, in solid waste, industries have used our government to make sure that you and I, mm -hmm. as taxpayers, pick up the junk in landfills and incinerators and electronics and stuff like that. Right. We have to pay the bill for their uh, bad manufacturing, for external costs they don't want to pay for. So government gets used for problems like nuclear waste. We, we, the government's getting stuck with 250,000 years of nuclear waste. Well, that's a rigged deal. Mm -hmm. that, that's the deal that you know, NSP, XL Energy, Westinghouse, General Electric have set up. So we end up picking up the tab while they get the internal benefits of the profits associated with the industry. Right. And see, and that's a very interesting um, look at this because a lot of people, you know, they know they need electricity. Right. They turn on the switch, it's on. They're not really thinking about how did they get that electricity. Right. And there's a lot of different ways that they could get electricity. And, of course, one way they could get electricity, of course, is through uh, wind-generated well, yeah, I mean, electricity. Yeah, exactly. But where's the money in that? Well, it's a good point. And <laughs> part of it is, is that there is a discussion that has to take place here mm -hmm. around energy because energy shapes our buildings, mm -hmm. our cities our foreign policy. Uh, many things are shaped by energy in the That's world today. Right. Our cost of living is shaped by energy. So just to give you an example, when NSP or XL Energy uses our government and, and orbits and influences it over many decades, what they've done is they've rigged a situation where they don't, basically they get paid more money when we use more energy. They don't care if it's wasted energy Mm -hmm. more useful energy. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is is that we are now wasting over 70 percent of the energy produced just into the atmosphere. What I'm proposing is that let's first when we talk about energy let's make sure we're proposing efficiency in energy. What that means is this from the point of production we want to make sure that energy is not wasted by capping it on site. The St. Paul Energy District does this. They do cogeneration where they cap the waste heat that leaves the facility, downtown St. Paul, and they turn it into a turbine. They save 46 percent of their energy on site. Mm -hmm. They power downtown St. Paul and the state capital, local, which is good. I want local energy. So then we could also add in housing codes and building codes, energy efficient windows, motors, refrigerators, air conditioners, things like that. We could save between the, we, between the two ways of saving energy, capping waste heat and efficient technologies, we could save over 70 percent of our energy use, no pie in the sky, no research and development, 
all done with existing technologies. And once we invest that way, now we're localizing dollars, billions of dollars. We spend 15 to 20 billion sending it out of the state every year for poisons we bring back and have to pay for endlessly. Right. And, 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 I, and I think, a, uh, and also a, a side benefit of this is that if you are encouraging people to do exactly what you've talked about and, and, and setting forth those kinds of measures, you actually encourage people to be more innovative and more creative in the kinds of uh, additional processes and ideas about how they can indeed achieve those results right now rather than right. just saying right. well we'll just go and let it just go off into the air and what right. do we care you know well, part of the this situation is a couple of things one is that we've been conditioned by major industries to take where we end up having to be responsible for bad manufacturing mm -hmm. so what ends up happening is that you and I are held responsible for recycling you and I are held responsible for the compact fluorescent light bulb or the energy efficient windows or whatever when in fact our government is supposed to be protecting us so up front we can get a hundred percent efficiency rather than maybe an individual can maybe do thirty percent at most mm -hmm. you know we should have, our government should be working for the common good the common people rather than the commercial interests right. which is what it's set up to do right now mm -hmm. and this is misguided mm -hmm. so what we end up having to clean up the mess after the fact when it should be taken care of up front so we need to use our public utilities commission as a vehicle to enforce that energy companies are adhering to energy efficiency mm -hmm. and that what that does is immediately when we can keep billions in our community keep billions in our pockets brings our cost of living down our government cost down our taxes down we have more dollars in our community recycling for housing health care education now we have pools of wealth to pay for those things Plus, our cost of living comes down, which means we have more time in our lives mm -hmm. for family, friends, social time, civic time, creative time. And so what that means is that if we start thinking about living in balance with the earth and using our policies for that, not only is it an economic ba benefit in a big way, but also we create two to ten times more jobs that are local jobs in efficiency and renewability. Mm -hmm. And now we go in efficiency, then we add the capacity, geothermal. White Bear Racket and Tennis Club, very good example, where they um, had paid $40,000 a year to heat five indoor tennis courts, bringing outside poisons to heat their tennis courts. They ripped out their floors. They put in tubes through their pond in their backyard. They now have in-floor heating, on-site, local self-reliance in energy, paying $1,500 a year to heat wow. those tennis courts on-site. That's my goal as governor. Right. We establish local self-reliant buildings, efficient, renewable, first. This is directly counter to those interests who want market control. But we have a planet on the blocks now. The citizens are going to have to decide if they're going to keep voting for interests that are using up the resources mm -hmm. or those that are going to heal. And that's what I'm here to do. I want policies that lead towards healing our resource base and establishing local economies rather than gutting our local economies the way the economic system is set right. up. Right. And I think... The, you know, your, your idea that we need to have more efficiencies on the front end yes. of this whole process, I think if people look at that sort of with their own um, personal perspectives, that if they, they put prevention and they work on things on the front end, it always kind of costs a little bit less than right. if they wait till later and then have uh, to pick up the pieces. Well, that's a good point. And part of it is, is that our economic incentives are dishonest right now. Yeah. We are not getting and, honest oh, accounts. And I understand that it sounds like we have a caller on the oh, line. we do? Yes, okay. okay. Uh, Great. And then we'll come right back yes, to your thoughts. But do. we want to make sure yeah, that we sure, get our caller. Sure. Caller, love are you it, there? Love it. Questions yes, or I comments am. for us this evening? Hi. Uh, just Th a second. We'll have, okay, we can hear you. Okay. Great. Thank you Thanks for, calling for in. your tremendous dedication. I really appreciate your program. And certainly I appreciate the great work of Ken Pentel. Mm -hmm. And, of course, your work, Diane, and bringing Ken into the limelight here for the public. Well, that's uh, why I, uh, public access is so important to uh, our community, because it uh, covers those things that the mainstream media just seems to overlook. Right. Right. Well, I think the mainstream media is bought and paid for by the corporations, so we can't really depend on them for real news. At any rate, um, yes, I do appreciate your great work, Diane, and also 
Ken Pentel. Um, my question is this. Um, do you agree with me when I, when I say that we could reduce taxes in this state and at the same time reduce destruction of the environment? My first question. Okay, yeah, good I, question. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, the thing is, is that we're paying a lot in taxes in wasteful infrastructure. I've used energy as an example. Uh, but other areas that uh, in transportation and sprawl, we're paying huge in taxes for bad planning in our planning of cities and communities. We're paying huge in taxes in agriculture policy, which are, are using up vast amounts of resources. We, through preventing problems up front, preventing ecological decline, we then reduce the taxation we have to pay for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, Environmental Quality Board, the Public Utilities Commission, because we're no longer having to monitor and clean up the mess from industry. That's what I'm trying to talk to people about. Mm -hmm. This is the most solid economic strategy that we have going in the state. The people are now going to have to start voting for it. Uh, it's because I'm ready to do the job. The Democrats and the Republicans are deceiving us uh, economically, or else I wouldn't be here. Great. <laughs> Good um, answer. Uh, Caller, uh, did you have another question for us? Yeah, my next question is, I know the state of Minnesota DNR is spending tens of millions of dollars every year with controlled burns that burn our, uh, burn our wetlands, torch our um, natural wildlife, and also destroy um, a lot of our natural plant life in order to raise um, grass to feed deer and also to raise grass-fed beef. It's a sort of a corporate form of uh, welfare to both the DNR itself for selling deer licenses and also to corporate farming for raising grass-fed beef. What is your opinion on that, uh, Mr. Pentel? Well, I do not want to see Minnesota turn into a playground. I want to see Minnesota re-diversified, basically. I want to establish wildlife corridors. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we are restoring our ecosystems based upon diverse tree types and, and wildlife species. Uh, so what we would do is shift away from just turning Minnesota into a playing field for sports people and, and so on into a rich, diverse habitat, mm -hmm. which is our natural economy. So I want to make sure that we start thinking about this, and part of the strategy would be to stop the type of clearing, massive clear cutting that may take place in northern Minnesota. I understand there's patches of cuts that can take place, but I want to replant for diversity of tree types, go to selective logging, make Minnesota sustainable logging practices, and then shift paper production to the farm. So farmers can grow um, hemp for paper. Uh, I, we produce our literature uh, that I gave you earlier mm -hmm. on Canaf, tree free. So oh, really? farmers, yeah, farmers can grow different types of crops and to I, produce paper. And I would have never even thought that because yeah. it feels like regular paper. Yeah. It's printed like regular paper. Yeah. I've been writing on it. That's right. That's it right. It seems. It's like tree paper. free. And these are the things what we can do is get farmers out mm -hmm. of the stress of global food production and mm -hmm. allow them to diversify their economies at the same time restoring our rural habitats uh, to diverse tree types and maintain the integrity of the forest in a way that doesn't require controlled burns. Uh, we can make sure that we have a state that is strong and intact for generations mm -hmm. to come. It just requires somebody who actually has a plan to do it. And that's what I'm prepared to do. Right. And also somebody who sees it as something that's feasible. Yeah. Because I think sometimes some policymakers, they go, well, yeah, I know about that. But is it really very feasible? It's like uh, talking about um, uh, energy uh, that's generated through wind power, right. using wind turbines. Uh, up until a few years ago, Minnesota was number three in uh, generation of energy through use of wind power. Right. Well, now I think we're number five. Well, right. some other states have kind of caught on, and and we, uh, you know, Minnesota, you know, has to get back to catching on to that. And I think some policymakers think, well, I, you know, that's that's one of those uh, fringe 
uh, concepts, but right. it really isn't. It, no, it's everything really we're talking about can be done. Yeah. The key, though, is to establish an honest democracy, mm -hmm. get big money out, also want to go to instant runoff voting and proportional systems mm -hmm. in Minnesota. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the things I'm talking about, because we can achieve removal of commercialization of our government until we get an honest democracy. Mm -hmm. And that is essential to healing our relationship to the earth mm -hmm. and our communities. And one of the points I wanted to make is the issue of honest accounting. Ah. When you talked about energy, if we were to take into account and put in the bottom line the whole cost in fossil fuel dependency, emphysema, asthma, bronchitis, cancer, death, lost days at work, if that went into the bottom line of fossil fuels, we would no longer have fossil fuels as a cheap source of fuel. It, it would be, be more expensive. Right. It wouldn't be cost effective exactly. any longer. Because we don't have honest accounting. Right. Nuclear storage. If we had to put 250,000 years of nuclear waste in the bottom line, we wouldn't have nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to get honest and go to whole cost accounting. And then the state will naturally heal itself and all incentives lead us there. So the mm -hmm. stress economically will not be the, uh, a problem anymore mm -hmm. on uh, ecological restoration. Mm -hmm. and Tremendous. I, it I sounds think that's like a we, great answer. It sounds like our caller still on the line with a qu another question. Oh, great. Keep it coming. Yeah. Keep it coming. <laughs> okay. And what's now, your name? Also, oh. I'm concerned about the 550 or so fish farms and spawning operations that are supported by the DNR, and some of them are re actually run by the DNR, and they are poisoning our lakes, rivers, and streams in the state of Minnesota, costing Minnesotans millions not only in terms of the damage that they do to our lakes, rivers, and streams, but also the kind of damage that comes from causing development of cancer and heart disease that kills about 8.5 out of every 10 Minnesotans. And uh, I'm very concerned about that. What do you think about controlling the damage that's done by these 550 fish farms and spawning operations a lot of fishermen don't really know or realize that we're, we're actually contributing to the demise of our waterways which, uh, where they fish from and they contract diseases from, from for all our waterways.